Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at monetary unit sampling. This topic is covered on the CPA exam as well as an auditing course. In this session, I would look at it from a simulation perspective or an exercise perspective. You might see on the exam, but going over the simulation, you'll be able to answer multiple choice questions and well as well. Monetary unit sampling is also known as dollar unit sampling. It means you're using the dollar as a unit rather than the account as a unit. So the sampling is based on the dollar. This means the higher the dollar amount and the population, the higher the probability that amount getting selected. And this is a common statistical method for test of the tails. Now, when you take this course in college, most of the students find hard time either understanding it or retain this information by the time they get to the CPA exam. What I suggest you do, if you're having any issues with this topic, I'm going to go over this exercise and explain everything in, in details as much as possible. I suggest you visit my website and check out my auditing and attestation course, which I explain this topic in details. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you haven't done so, YouTube is what I suggest you subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, auditing, tax, finance, as well as Excel tutorial. If you like my lectures, please like them, share them, put them in playlist. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit other people. Connect with me on Instagram. On my website, farhatlectures.com, this is where I have additional lectures and resources to help you understand the material. The difference between what I offer in a CPA prep course is I teach you the material. The CPA prep course assumes you know the material and they move on on reviewing it with you. That's the difference. So check out my course if you are looking to add 10 to 15 points to your CPA exam. So let's take a look at this question and try to answer and explain what's what we are being given here there's a lot of information although it's going to be asking only to compute the sample size but in order to compute the sample size we're going to have to learn a lot of material an auditor is determined the appropriate sample size for testing inventory valuation using monetary unit sampling as i said it's a, it's a dollar it's a dollar unit sampling the population has 3140 inventory item this is how many items we have. The dollar value is 19,325. The tolerable misstatement is 575,000. And we are at a 10% acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance. And no misstatements are accepted in the population, zero misstatement. We have a lot of variables here. We have the number of unit items, 3140. We have the population value, 19 million, we have the tolerable misstatement, we have area, the acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance, I'm just gonna call it area for now and in the future, and the, and the expected misstatement is zero. And all we have to do is compute N, which is the sample size. So simply put, how many units are we gonna be selecting from this 3,140 inventory unit? The first thing is you have to know the formula on how to compute the sample size. So let's look at the formula first, then we'll explain every variable in details and see how does it affect the formula. Simply put, the formula is something called the confidence interval. Hold on a second. You just added a new factor, the confidence interval. Where is that coming from? Don't worry, I will show you where is that coming from in a moment. The confidence interval divided by tolerable misstatement, which is tolerable misstatement, this one here, 575, as a percentage, which is mean divide by the population. And what's the population? The population is 19,350,000. So in the numerator, we have the confidence interval. So let's start with the confidence interval. Well, yes, let's start with the confidence interval. Let's start with the numerator. Let me ask you this. If you are selecting from a population and you want more confidence, so if, you're, if you want your confidence to go up, let me ask you this. Do you select more samples or less samples? And I hope you know that if you want more confidence, your sample size goes up. Your sample size goes up. Now, how do you, how do you come up with this confidence interval? It's not giving in the problem. Well, on the CPA exam, they might give you the confidence interval or they might ask you to, uh, to look it up. I'm going to show you how to look up the confidence interval. How do you look up the confidence interval? You look up the confidence interval from a table called the confidence interval table. That's basically what it is. And what do you need to select the confidence interval? You need the risk of incorrect acceptance and the number of 
misstatements expected. So, in this problem, we are saying the risk of incorrect acceptance. Now, we're going to start to define what we are giving. We are giving this is as 10% and no misstatement. It means the misstatement is zero. So, what does it mean 10% area? Well, 10% area, risk of incorrect acceptance, it's right here, this column here, this is 10% area. It means if, if we are taking a 10% area, it means we are 90% confident that what we're doing is correct. It means there's a still a 10% chance we could make the incorrect, uh, incorrect decision. If you want to be 100% confidence, the risk of incorrect acceptance will be zero. If you want the risk of incorrect acceptance to be zero, there's no sampling. If you want your risk to be zero, you have to, to look at everything 100%. Here, we are saying we are taking a chance 10% that we could be wrong. Okay? So let me ask you this. If you are taking a chance, so let's look at area versus N. Okay? Versus the sample size. If you want to take less of a chance, so let's assume you want to take a 5% chance rather than 10% chance. What's going to happen to your sample size. If you want to take less chance, you have to look for more. So n will go up. So there is a negative relationship, negative relationship between area and the sample size. So if you said, you know what, I want to take 20% chance. Well, if I have to take 20% chance, I can look at less. So notice if I increase this to 20, I have less sample size. So this is the area. Area is what chance am I making? The number of overstatement, misstatement, the number of misstatement, but remember when we are doing dollar unit sampling, we're always looking for overstatement. So that's why it says it should be number of misstatement. Notice here the number of misstatement are expected, the, the, no, no misstatement expected to be zero. So we're looking at 10% and number of misstatement is zero. Again, overstatement is listed here because you're always doing overstatement when you're doing MUS sampling. So simply put, if we are taking a 10% chance with the number of misstatements equal to zero, our factor is 2.31. And voila, we just find out our numerator, which is 2.31. This is the confidence factor. Now, let me go back and show you. If you want to take more of a chance, more of a chance, more of a chance, notice your confidence interval goes down because you are taking more of a chance. If you want to take less of a chance, your confidence interval goes up. Okay, notice notice how the confidence interval is affecting this. Also, if you expect more misstatement, if you expect rather than one, you're expecting, rather than zero, you're expecting one misstatement. Well, if you're expecting one misstatement, your confidence interval will go up, will have to go up. The confidence interval will go up. So notice it's it goes from 2.31. You want more confidence now to 3.89 because you're expecting misstatement. So simply put, the confidence interval is 2.31. Okay, so basically we defined area and how does it relate to the end? So we're done with this, with this, with this word and with this word. We still have to find the denominator, which is the denominator is a computation between something called tolerable misstatement and the population. Well, let's talk about tolerable misstatement first. Tolerable misstatement. What is tolerable misstatement? With how much, how many misstatements I can tolerate without reject, rejecting the population? Here, what we're saying is something like this. I, if this is zero, I can tolerate up to 575 misstatement. Okay. Let me ask you this. If you can tolerate more, let's assume rather than 575, you can tolerate 700,000 tolerable misstatement. If I can tolerate more misstatements, I don't have to look for more because even though I'm sampling. So simply put, if my tolerable misstatement goes up, if I'm willing to tolerate more misstatements, I don't have to get a lot of ends. Therefore, there's a negative relationship between tolerable misstatement as and sample size. Why? Because I can tolerate more. If I, if I cannot tolerate more, if I reduce this tolerable misstatement to 300,000. So if my tolerable misstatement goes down, I have to increase my sample size. Also a negative relationship between those two. Okay. So now we have the tolerable misstatement and we got to take the tolerable misstatement and divide it by the population. The population is 19,325,000. Generally speaking, if you have higher population, you need a higher end, but it's not proportional proportionate. So if the population double, it doesn't mean you have to double your size. But generally speaking, you can say higher population would require a higher sample size. Now let's fit this whole thing together and see what is our sample size because that's the question. But to find out the sample size, 
we had to go through all of this. So notice what I want you to notice is I ignored the, num the number of inventory because this is a dollar unit sampling. Um, I don't care about how many units I have for now when I ca compute my sample. So TM is 575,000. As a percentage of the population, the population is 19,325. Let's compute this, um, this uh, denominator, 575 divided by 19,325,000, and that's 0.297. I'm going to make it 0.3, so 0.3%, point, point 0.03 is my, sorry, 0 0.03 is my denominator. Now I'm going to take 2.31 divided by 0.03, equal to 77 simply put i have to be, uh, i have to sample 77 units 77 of those 31 31 40. this is the number of number of unit i want to sample so basically we answered the first question but it's very important to understand how each one of those factors the population tolerable misstatement area and the number of misstatements affect n okay because Simply on the exam, they could always. I could ask you fifteen different questions about those five factors and how do they how do they affect. And once you understand them, you'll be able to answer all my fifteen questions. Okay, so make sure you understand how it works. Once again, you can go to my YouTube if you're interested to learn more. Not I mean to my website if it, to learn more about this topic. So we find out the sample size is seventy-seven. That's fine. That's if you're asking about that. Now, assuming. Assuming, here's what, what we're being asked next. Assuming a random starting point of 123,608. What does that mean? It means we selected, we went to Excel, and we asked Excel to generate a random number. Or just basically, we asked one of our uh, teammates, select a number between 100 and 200,000, and they came up with this number. So simply put, the, we selected a random starting point. Even Excel, if you go to Excel, there is a random function, random, and you can just ask them random between two numbers. Like, it's something like this. It's random, and you open parentheses, and you put one and a thousand, and it will give you a number between one and a thousand. Here, between one and whatever the number is, but the the point is, it's randomly selected. Identify the cumulative dollar amount associated with the first five samples. So simply put, they're asking us, you uh, you selected the um, show me the five the first five account you're going to be selecting from those 3,124. So how do we do this? How do we do this? So the random starting point is 123,608. Well, what we do at this point, we have all these accounts. We have, what you have to understand is we have those inventory account and we have them in total of 19,325. So we have item one, item two, item three, item four, item five, item six, all the way to 3,140. And those are, and those are, uh, they have a, each one of them has a dollar amount. So the first one is 100, the second one 200, the third one is 400. I'm just giving those dollar amounts. So here's what's going to happen the cumulative, the first one is 100, the second one, the cumulative 100 plus 200 equal to 300. The third one, this is the cumulative column, 400 plus 300 equal to 700. And let's assume the fourth one is 1,000, the fourth unit. So that's the cumulative is 1,400, so on and so forth. So you guys get the point. So we the, we have the cumulative, and this is how we compute the cumulative. Although, although we are not given the cumulative here, but the point is, how do you how do you select those units? So here's what you do. The first one, let's assume, let's add zeros to these numbers, the cumulative were 100,000, 300,000, 700,000, 1.7 million. So those are all add zeros to them, okay? So to make it more realistic. So if you are being asked, assume a random starting point of 123,608. So we find the random point. So the random point is 123,608. Then how do you find the second random dollar selected? So this is the, the starting point. So 123,608, it's in between 100,000 and 300,000. Therefore, we would select item number two. Now, how do we select the following item? Because we need to select five items. Here's what we do. We'll take the total population, 19,325,000, and we'll divide this number by the sample size of 77. So let's do that. 
So if we take 19,325,000 divided by 77, and that's going to give us $250,097. $250,097, just rounded, $97. What, is, what does that mean? This is called the sampling interval. This is called the sampling interval. So how do we use the sampling interval? Here's what's going to happen. So this is the first item. How do we select the second item? We're going to take 123,608 and we're going to add to it the sampling interval of 250 and $97. So the second item will be 374,582. Now, 374,582 falls between 300 and 400,000, therefore we'll select item three. Then item, the third item will be 374,582 plus 250,097. And that's gonna give us 625,000 556. It's it falls between two and three. We already selected three, so basically third is we, it's not really useful. The fourth item, 625, 550 plus 250 plus the interval, and that's gonna give us 876,530. 876,530 is in between those two. We select the fourth item. I mean, here the, it seems they are. I'm selecting every item that that's because the numbers are yeah I just made up those numbers so it doesn't have to be correct and the fifth item is 876,530 plus 250,097 dollars which is equal to 1 million um, 127,504 again I would look for that interval and I would select the number so this is how you would select the five items. This is how you would select the five items. So this is how you would select the five items. So we learn how to compute n, which is the sample size. We learn how to find out the five items. This, th these questions, again, I can ask you so many different questions about, about, about this question. So make sure you understand how to find the sample, what each item means, and how to find a particular item from this. In the next session, what I would do is I would assume a sample of 100 unit was obtained and this were the results and I will compute the bound, the overstatement bound. Remember, it's always overstatement when we're, when we're using MUS and draw the audit conclusion. As always, I would like to remind you to like my recording, uh, share it, visit my website for additional lectures about this topic and auditing if you want to improve your CPA exam preparation score check out my website, study hard and stay safe, especially if we are living through the, through the coronavirus.